And with that, Catherine, our esteemed moderator, ICPSR council member and former chief statistician of the United States, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. The first thing I had to do was unmute myself because I have a habit of talking away on mute and that's not very useful. Uh, welcome to everybody. I see we're now up to 137 participants. So we may win some award for this. I'm not sure what the situation is on that. Um, but it is my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, session today and my special pleasure to welcome the panelists who will be presenting to you. I'm, I, since I can't see who the now 139 participants are, I'm, I will have to make a judgment that I'm probably at least 90% of you are really familiar with the census and that's probably why you're um, joining us for this webinar. Um, and I really do not want to take a whole lot of time um, from the panelists by going into great detail about what the census is all about. Um, it, it is about um, everything from the uh, apportionment and redistricting of our political uh, uh, sphere to um, distributing um, trillions and trillions and more dollars uh, at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, and I only know what's distributed based on uh, federal funding. I'm sure there are repercussions down the road um, in, in cities and towns all over the country. Um, we, uh, if the count is accurate, that's great. If it's inaccurate, uh, then that's not so great given the many important uses to which the data are put. Um, we, uh, we are concerned given all that has happened uh, in the last year uh, and particularly the pandemic about the effects that that may have on the census uh, and its quality and its use utility for various uh, purposes in the current period. Uh, we are also extremely concerned and I think um, at least one of my panelists will emphasize this and that's Nancy. I, about the uh, transparency with which things are being conducted and, and to which, uh, which not just the research community, but the public at large have access to information about what, what may be happening and what the quality may look like. Um, we, we have a really neat panel for you today because we have the census historian um, par excellence, Margot Anderson, who is um, a professor emerita at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison um, but as far as I'm concerned, um, Margot is real special to me because of her uh, volume on the census, the, the um, history of the census. Um, and Margot, I was thrilled recently to learn uh, that I can still get copies of it on Amazon. I, I purchased one not that long ago. My own copy is, is um, loved and marked and so on, but um, I needed to share and I didn't want to give away my personal loved copy. So, um, so Margot will be our first panelist today. Um, Nancy Potok uh, will be our second panelist. Nancy, uh, as, as I did, uh, left the government um, <clears throat> uh, in recent years, but um, her government career is particularly um, uh, relevant for what we're doing here today. Um, she did uh, serve as chief statistician in the United States for a few years um, prior to that. She had been a deputy director at the Census Bureau. Uh, she had been a deputy undersecretary of the Department of Commerce and had been uh, in other roles at the Census Bureau. And all of those uh, uh, are relevant to and make her an expert on what uh, she will be presenting today. Um, Allison Plyer uh, um, is in the city of New Orleans and I'm, Allison, I'm, I'm really hesitant to say whether we've met before or not, because I recently was in a meeting with Denise Ross and I said, well, I know everybody that's meeting except Denise. And she said, yeah, well, we met. <laughs> um, but when she was with the city of New Orleans or working on, on the issues that were going on, um, Allison uh, brings a local perspective, uh, obviously, to our conversation today. Uh, she's well known. Um, it, for her work in New Orleans and in cooperation with um, our colleagues at, at Brookings 
on particularly looking at the effects of disasters. Um, and if, if, if ever, Allison, we had a disaster um, in the making here, I think we've got one, not the, not, not the hurricane type. But anyway, um, those, those are our three panelists um, who will be presenting to you today. Um, and uh, I, not, I guess Anna said it, but please, if you have questions, um, put them in the Q&A section down below on your screen, and we'll be addressing those um, after we hear from the three panelists. With that, Margo, would you please get us started? Uh, good morning or good afternoon, um, depending upon um, which time zone you're in. Um, and uh, I'm here to give you some historical context. Um, and Anna is running my slides, so she can switch one right now. Okay, I'm going to basically lay out sort of the, a little bit of background, very brief background on the census in the context of where we are now. And um, in particular, um, the very, very fast breaking news about um, uh, the litigation that came out last night, um, as well as uh, the sort of long term context of um, what's been going on since for the last couple hundred years. So we've done this census uh, because it's in the Constitution uh, on the year zero since 1790. This is the 24th. And I'm going to now detail the uses of the census because that's where we are now in terms of deciding whether this, the results we're going to get, given the pandemic and the political meddling, are um, going to be usable. So the first is, of course, reapportionment, which is in the Constitution, which the U.S. has done um, every census uh, except for 1920. I'll end on that um, very briefly and can talk about it if, 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 in more detail if need be. Uh, next slide. The, um, the other three major uses, uh, and um, I'm going to suggest that the data requirements and the quality of the data are somewhat um, related to the uses and that what will work for some things won't work for others. So redistricting um, is, has been again done since the outset of the census process. This is what is called the PL94171 file, which according to um, statute is supposed to come out one year after census day. Um, this year, um, especially given yesterday's ruling, I assume might, it might be later, uh, depending on what the courts do. Um, we also use the census for um, the, the sort of ground, the grounding of most funding. Um, and that again goes back into the 1830s. Um, it's, basically just not, not only the, the count itself, but a variety, variety of variables um, and denominator back, uh, background for the census. And finally, of course, researchers, so the kind of world of ICPSR and um, academics and think tanks and so forth. All of us use census data a lot. Now, all of this has gone on um, whether people at the time or later thought the census was accurate. So what, the rest of what I want to talk about today is what happens when things do go wrong, because clearly they've gone wrong this round. Next slide. So what can go wrong? And I'm going to, these are mostly taken from the American census uh, history, but there, um, and there's lots, lots, lots and lots of them, but they're scattered through the narrative rather than focused on as a particular problem um, that we see now. Um, so again, some, some examples. In, in 1850, which is the first time that California is in the union, it's just been admitted, uh, the census uh, results for a chunk were lost at sea. So the census director uh, wrote to uh, the secretary and Congress and said, what do we do? Congress authorized a second representative um, for the state of California without the returns. And they did, the, they did a redo in 1852. And that number, that, those data were attached to the published 1850 counts. Uh, similarly, in, 18, in the 1870s uh, census at after the Civil War, uh, there was much disruption in the South. The, US, the, the Union Army was still occupying a, most of the South. And the, the count came in low. And if you read the census uh, uh, reports, you can see that. Nevertheless, Congress reapportioned 20 years later in 1890. 
at the 1890 census, they quietly revised the official number, adding 1.26 million people. If you look at historical uh, statistics of the US, you will find that the count is listed as 38.9, not 38.1. Next slide. Now, if you think this is just in the past, um, recounts and so forth, and controversies about undercounts, no, no, no. Um, New York, Philadelphia, and Indianapolis were recounted in 1880, for example. Um, uh, I love this, Philip, because the, 18, the Indianapolis count came in 19% higher, but that was not because of the census counted more, but because they changed the geographic boundaries of the city between the two counts. And in 1980, a century later, uh, the census uh, office in Bed-Stuy, and of course, this is still in the paper era, burned. Notice that when it burned, October of 1980, and the entire area had to be recounted. This is again, next slide. Now, people knew at the time that there, these problems existed. Um, and so there was a, a, a period of a late 19th and early 20th century where there was a particular problem with what was called padding or census fraud. And this is a, just an example of a couple of the newspaper reports um, from uh, 1900 and, um, you know, um, 1900 and 1910. Uh, the Census Bureau got a hold of this after it became a permanent agency in uh, 1902, and it, the, that, that abuse of the counting process basically stopped. I can talk about that as well. Next slide. Um, nevertheless, it does reappear in 2010. Um, here is an example of um, the, again, from the New York Daily News and the New York Times, uh, reporting that um, a, a regional director of the Census Bureau um, said that people had curb stoned, as the term came to be, a good chunk of uh, the results from their local area. And it, again, had to be redone. Next slide. Okay. More recently, we've been concerned uh, about the problems with the census with discouraging participation or raising suspicion about confidentiality. Uh, I'm throwing these in here because, of course, they, they, they affect how the Census Bureau sets up its operations and, and the kinds of trust that they need to uh, guarantee in order for the data to be used. And so here is um, the example from 2000 when we still had the long form, when um, Republicans were quite concerned that um, these were intrusive questions, um, that privacy was being invaded. Uh, we use the 2000 census in any case. Next slide. And of course, in the late 2000, uh, 2000 in the run-up to 2010, uh, Michelle Bachman from Minnesota um, threatened to boycott, organize a boycott of the census. She was, in fact, chastised by her Republican con uh, colleagues, uh, and I love the quote, boycotting the constitutionally mandated census is illogical, illegal, and not in the best interest of the country. Um, and, and ominously, of course, since Republicans did not, not support census adjustment, it opens the door for partisans to statistically adjust census results. Next, we, nevertheless, we use the 2010 census. Next slide. So if you if we want to think about this, and I think um, the issues after the census, we're still in the during phase, um, but we're very quickly moving toward the after phase. And so what the what we see if you read the history of the operational development is how is is mechanisms for the census bureau to manage all of these issues next slide so the self enumeration era um, in particular are are uh, you know which is our more recent history is to try to build in pa um, operational uh, activities that that uh, guarantee that the account will go forward. Exactly the kinds of um, problems um, that we've had this time um, uh, that are designed to prevent. And essentially, we, you know, the the operational procedures are, uh, you know, have a lot of redundancy built in them to protect the count as it goes forward. Those have been thrown into a contact with the pandem pandemic. 
Next slide. Now, the real threat going forward, and I'm going to stop in this slide. I have a few more, which you should be able to see, um, and maybe I have to, um, we can talk about it later. But in the, there, there is also good historical information about what you do after the count um, uh, if, in fact, it isn't uh, acceptable or we want, uh, and so forth. And the, this is a, a negative example because, of course, what in the 1920s, what Congress did is not reapportion itself. And I am not recommending that we do that, but that we study the reaction that the areas of the country that were, were threatened with loss of political power, what they, the questions that they raised in order to be able to understand where we're going to go forward when we do get numbers, and we will eventually. The problem in 1920 was that the urban areas were growing much more rapidly than the rural areas, and they this, uh, and yet the Congress was controlled by the rural members. So even though it was not a partisan issue, the, all three branches were controlled by Republicans, uh, the, uh, the, there wasn't a, an apportionment bill passed until 1929 for the 1930 census. So let me stop there. And uh, I think I'm, I haven't used up too much of my time and we'll go from, we'll move on. Thank you. Shall I just start? And now, and now, I'm sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. <laughs> and now, if you would call, it's Nancy Potak who will be speaking next. Thank you. Okay, I will. Um, I'm trying to share my screen and start my slideshow. And I think that does it. Okay, thanks, Catherine. Um, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, I am planning to talk a little bit about, as Catherine pointed out, um, transparency and how that relates to the data quality. So let me just start um, by getting kind of to the heart of the data quality issue. There was um, a panel earlier this week, I think on Tuesday, that really did more of a deep dive into a lot of these issues. So if you did not see that one, and these are being recorded, I recommend that if you want to know a lot more um, technically about some of these things, that um, you also go back and, and review the other panel if you missed it. Um, but just at a high level, um, I think some of the environmental factors, a few of which have been already mentioned, that are really beyond the Census Bureau's control. Um, was the, the COVID pandemic, um, the hurricanes and the floods and the wildfires that displace people and make them very hard to find and count in the right place, which is an important component of the census. Um, it's not just how many people, it's exactly which block they're in. Um, and then, other things that have been floating around in the ether generally about the census that affect people's willingness to participate. So we had a lot of, um, a lot of angst about the citizenship question that was proposed to be put on the census. Ultimately, the Supreme Court turned that down on the basis of um, that the Commerce Department and the Secretary of uh, Commerce was not forthright about the reasons for putting the citizenship question on and therefore that was a violation of the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, and so, but still, um, I think surveys are showing that people believe that the citizenship question is still on there. They don't know that it's not on there. And then, um, of course, people's attitudes about government and that also is nonpartisan because I think people on all parts of the political spectrum right now have a lot of mistrust of government for various reasons and are concerned and don't necessarily believe that the Census Bureau is going to protect their data as it's required to do by law. Um, and then we have a lot of political influence that has been exerted on the professionals at the Census Bureau. And I'll get to some of, some of the protections that the Census Bureau professionals should have, but clearly are not 
um, under those protections right now with the way things are going. And so we've got um, three and possibly four political appointees on site at the Census Bureau who have been uh, appointed and are doing kind of the deep dive into census operations, which is pretty much unheard of. Um, we've had these executive orders, um, some of which have already been turned down by the courts that, um, again, going back to, you need to ask the citizenship question. And um, when you have the census numbers, even though the census um, language itself um, is amended in the Constitution is very clear about counting every resident of the United States, regardless of their um, citizenship status. Um, we have presidential memorandums um, that are asking the Census Bureau to calculate the census numbers, leaving people out of the census. Um, and then we have these changes to the Census Bureau's schedule that were primarily driven by the COVID-19 pandemic um, where there were delays where there were problems hiring people and getting people to go door to door but the schedule has gone back and forth from the census bureau being very clear as late as late july that they needed a lot of extra time in order to do uh, the best census that they could and keep it as accurately accurately done as possible um, and so not only did they need more time in the fields because of the delayed start to collect the information and to let people self-respond, but they also needed a lot of time for processing all of the information after it was collected. And I'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, and they very clearly, the administration had asked for an extension of the statutory deadlines in the House um, had passed legislation that did extend the deadlines, um, but the Senate never did pass the legislation. There's a, there's a bipartisan proposal that's out there now to extend it, but it, it's really not um, in law right now. So they, the Senate did not step in to um, help the professionals at the Census Bureau conduct the census that they said they needed to conduct in order to have the most accurate census that they could have under all of these circumstances. Um, now, I wanna talk a second about the Information Quality Act requirements because that gets to the heart of the transparency issue. Um, and Catherine knows a lot about this because in Catherine's years as chief statistician, um, and then in, in my stint as chief statistician, um, part of that job is to be responsible for OMB putting out guidance to the statistical agencies and other agencies that are putting out information about some of the quality issues. So transparency is at the top of the list. And what that means is that agencies need to document and make public the processes that they're using. And I think that's the heart of some of the issues that we have now with what's happening at the Census Bureau, because the Census Bureau is not being transparent. They're not putting out a lot of information. They're putting out some information, but it, it's not sufficient. Um, and so you, and they, in their abbreviated schedule, they have um, cut out some of the very important quality control steps in the post data um, collection processing, some of the things where they would be double programming the software, for example, to find glitches or bringing in outside parties to look at um, the address list um, to bring in state and local officials. So up front, there's a review, state and local, but a lot of times the Census Bureau could miss things like group quarters and they cut out those steps. Very important things um, and then documenting all the processes and the results. And the documentation is not there. The data is not forthcoming to check the quality. And so transparency is very much lacking. Um, and then some of that, again, will depend on, on how the lawsuits are, are resolved. There was reference to a um, decision that just came out from Northern California that said that the Census Bureau has to stick to the original schedule and miss the statutory deadlines in the interest of accuracy and because um, the, the 
reasons from outside the Census Bureau for shortening the schedule um, were not sufficient either. Um, but that will be appealed to the Supreme Court and we don't know ultimately how that will come out. So when you have the shortened schedule, you have many steps along the way where quality can be degraded. Um, people sort of think of the census if they don't really know a lot about it as being, you know, the data collection piece where people either self-respond and the interviewers go out, but it actually is a much longer process. It starts with a good address list um, after a decade of testing and preparation. And then after the data are collected, there's numerous steps that I think the Tuesday panel went into um, for processing the data before it's really ready for public release. And the key thing here to keep in mind is that you know, while no census is ever 100% accurate, you want a census that is um, at least kind of distributively accurate so that different geographic parts of the country are not um, disadvantaged disproportionately or certain demographic groups are not disadvantaged. So you may have some states, for example, where you get a hundred percent response of everybody has either self-responded or was at home or had a, had a good response and it's high quality. And then you have other parts of the country where you have very low self-response and the interviewers have not been able to get out there. And then you have to turn to these other um, techniques which are much lower quality. So the Census Bureau is simply saying that they finished, you know, 99% response doesn't really tell you enough about um, the quality because the different ways that you get to 99% in different parts of the country can have a huge effect on that. Um, and I think this is, goes into this a little bit more where you have more proxy responses of neighbors, you have more counts where it's population only um, and things of that nature. So, um, what I think is called for here is really, if you want the transparency that's required and needed, um, there needs to be a public set of metrics to measure quality. Um, there needs to be an assessment of the quality by an objective outside body. Not that the Census Bureau can't do it, but I, but I think given the political influence that is being exerted and the pressures on the professional staff there right now, you would probably want an objective outside body to do that. Um, in addition, um, the stakeholders need to be able to determine the fitness for use of the data. Um, as was mentioned, the data are used for many things. I mean, there is the apportionment, of course, in the redistricting, but then the funding allocations also, and there's a myriad of those. And so to be truly transparent, the public really needs to be able to see the quality, understand it, Congress needs to understand it and determine, is, are these data good enough to be used for the purpose that they're intended for? And maybe they're not. Um, so then also researchers, I think, can really help contribute a lot in the current environment. So access to the 2020 census data should be made available um, expeditiously to researchers in, in um, you know, that can be done in a secure environment like the research data center that's at University of Michigan or other similar types of secure environments. The other thing that happens because the operations of the census are sequential is that data become available at different times. So not everything is gonna be available before December 31st or even by April. And so continuing analyses of these data when they become available is critically important. And then, um, you know, I think as Margot alluded to, um, a lot of times reforms and changes happen after a census, after, after you have situations that are perceived to be pretty negative around the census. Um, you can have reforms. And so I think it's very important not to just say, okay, the census is done, let's go on and repeat this process for the 2030 census, but to really step back, take stock, look at the lessons learned, see if we need legislative changes, see if we need more protections for 
uh, the Census Bureau or maybe other, the whole statistical system, um, because clearly a lot of the protections that have been built up over the decades um, were not sufficient in this case to really allow the Census Bureau to do the job that they wanted to do and that they publicly said they needed to do uh, and then were prevented from doing. So I think we, we really need to look at this um, through that transparency and reform lens as well. Thank you, Nancy. We're gonna zip right over to Allison now. Allison, you need to unmute. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you all so much. Um, it's really an honor to be part of this uh, this panel and I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see, there it is. Uh, so I can do a quick presentation about um, how this is affecting um, about disasters in the 2020 census. Um, and um, I should mention um, as that I live in New Orleans, but I evacuated New Orleans um, uh, in late August in advance of several hurricanes that have approached and, and missed the city. Um, but uh, I'm in now in northern New Jersey, um, where I, it's a beautiful day and I'm outside and there's, there might be somebody working on their yard not far away, so I apologize if there's any background noise. Um, so, you know, uh, the, right, currently there's about uh, roughly about 11 million Amer uh, people in the United States who have not yet been counted by the census. And um, southern states um, that have uh, are disproportionately undercounted at this point, in, uh, and these are states that are reeling from hurricanes right now. Um, so, in late uh, August, um, tens of thousands of people um, uh, who had not yet been counted uh, were struck by Hurricane Laura. Now they are. Um, on the, on the go between hotels, shuffling around um, in Louisiana and Texas. Um, then tens of thousands more people evacuated because of wildfires in um, parts of California and Oregon. And um, in addition to that, air quality across most of the West Coast was so severe, um, severely poor in, in over, over several days that uh, numerators couldn't get people to open their doors to actually answer the census questions. Um, last week, um, Hurricane Sally uh, slammed into the coast of uh, Florida and Alabama, really devastating coastal communities there. And then this week, um, Hurricane Beta, we're now in the Greek alphabet, has drenched uh, Louisiana and Texas um, with tropical storms, um, force rains and winds. So um, all these are having tremendous effects on uh, the total enumeration in several states. And um, this is a, a map of, from the Census Bureau about, about the disasters that are current this week. Um, and so obviously these are not the stable kinds of conditions needed for a complete enumeration of the, of the U.S. And of course, we're, we don't normally do non-response follow-up during this time frame. Normally it's done, you know, earlier in the year, not during hurricane and um, wildfire seasons. So um, this, this was a bad combination of events between the pandemic and um, the many uh, disasters that, were, that are currently affecting the nation. Um, and as my colleagues on this panel pointed out, um, you know, this data is used in so many ways for a, a myriad of funding programs for health, mental health, um, schools, uh, uh, meals for low-income students, um, you know, elder care programs, child care programs, et cetera. It's also used for businesses to decide where they're going to open or reopen businesses. Um, so it's really important for communities affected by disasters that this data be accurate. They will suffer doubly if they don't have good census data to help um, drive funding to those communities as they struggle to rebuild. And um, I'm honored to have the privilege of, of chairing the Census's Scientific Advisory Committee. And last week, we also unanimously recommended that the, the, uh, the, the time needs to be extended not only for non-response follow-up, but as Nancy said, for the really important sequential data processing steps that have to happen to really check all the data. Um, because this data is used also for a myriad of legal mandates and regulatory uses for 10 years. Um, and, and we need to keep those in mind as well for the quality of the data. So I'll just say one quick thing about, one more thing about why data is so important after a disaster. Um, 
governments and, and non-governmental organizations. Wow, it suddenly got really loud in the background here, didn't it? That was the motorcycle. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so there's often a, 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 a vacuum of data after a disaster, um, and this makes it hard for um, decision makers to make decisions about where to put resources, how to prioritize, et cetera. And why is that? Well, it's because disasters cause an, a, an enormous break in the status quo, followed by flux. And all of you can reflect on your own experience of COVID and know exactly what I'm talking about. An enormous break in the status quo, followed by flux, right? And so the people who experienced also hurricanes and wildfires right now are experiencing that on additional dimensions beyond what all of us are experiencing because of COVID. And this little chart of um, just labor force participation shows you how dramatic a, a disaster can affect a trend and why data then becomes so important because our understanding of of our conceptual understanding of what's happening, our situational awareness is dramatically affected, and we need empirical evidence, we need data to make decisions more than ever after a disaster. So data really is critical to disaster recovery. Um, it, it helps policymakers and philanthropists to inform their resource allocations. It helps um, pu publicly available data, helps policymakers justify decisions in an uncertain environment and dispel misconceptions that tend to circulate after a disaster. And also um, publicly available data can really catalyze private sector rebuilding activity. This, this is one of the findings we have post Katrina in New Orleans from disseminating good data. It catalyzed private sector rebuilding investments because it reduced uncertainties. So um, that is all of my presentation, and I will turn it back over to Catherine. Thank you, Allison. Uh, we do have several questions in the Q&A, um, and I, I'm just going to go through them uh, quickly. And um, the first one is, if the census counting period is delayed from September 30th until October 31st, the timeline for apportionment numbers being reported is to go from December 31st until April. <clears throat> is there a fear if we don't have the 30 day delay in counting that it will affect the total population apportionment counts? The delay would allow for three additional months on top of the extended counting period for reporting the numbers. Um, so uh, would one of my panelists like to touch that one? Yeah, I, I'll, I can go. Um, so yeah, I think the idea is that the Census Bureau stated pretty clearly that they needed a data collection period that went through October 31st in order to conduct the operations that they needed. So cutting them off at September 30th um, causes them to go and use um, a less accurate basis for determining how many, what is the population state by state. And I think, um, so some states would be affected more than others, but it certainly would affect the apportionment count if they stop early. Um, let me, this is Margo, let me add, add that this is where I think we're still awaiting um, sort of guidance both from the Bureau. I have not seen a response from the Bureau this morning on, on this, um, nor have I seen a response from the Justice Department over whether they're going to take this to the Supreme Court or the, or the Court of Appeals or the, or, or the Supreme Court. So this, the moving parts are just staggering in, in all of this right now. And um, uh, uh, I, my advice to everyone is just to watch the news <laughs> and just follow it. I think that's what we're all doing. Watch your, watch your news and watch your, your devices. I, I, I can't go to sleep without getting something on my device. <laughs> and I can't wake up without something more being there. I'm, and here's someone who wants us to really speculate. Uh, will the Supreme Court hear an appeal before September 30th? If not, is there any chance NERFU, that's the non-response follow-up, work will resume after September 30th? Got any betters here? <laughs> same answer, same question, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Which is, exactly. yeah, right. It's going to be the lawyers are sort of uh, um, sort of running the show. I think uh, what today is uh, 
Today is Friday. Um, by Monday, we may get some clarification. This one is a different, different uh, stream here. It says, what can we do to increase public and congressional awareness about these problems? Are there any public letters we can sign onto or templates we can use for sharing on social media or sending a letter to our representatives? Again, um, there are lots of uh, active, uh, um, you know, blogs and so forth following these matters. The Census Project is one um, that is very useful. They also follow the appropriations for uh, the count and so forth. And so I would just look around and, um, and contact your own uh, member of Congress and senator and see what you get. I mean, if nothing else, that will raise their awareness because they'll have to answer you. <laughs> I, Margo, I would, I would add to that. Um, there is a, um, a congressional uh, sign-on thing uh, by Schatz and, um, sorry, I've slipped my brain on who the other um, major person is on the Hill. Uh, there's more than one. But um, that letter uh, is being signed by members on the House and Senate side, and one could be encouraged to get in touch again with one's representatives to get your representatives um, to sign on to those kinds of letters that, that are around. Um, here's our old friend David McMillan. Uh oh, it went away. <laughs> Hello, David McMillan. Assuming <laughs> David wants to know assuming we fail in attempts to give census more time in the field and in the machines in Suitland. What can local governments do to improve their numbers? Can local governments adjust their numbers using ACS counts to ratio or ratio estimates? Are there other things they could do? You know, That's an Allison question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, I mean, the, the problem is the ACS um, is based on the census. Um, so, um, you know, one could potentially look at some other administrative data sets and try to make some of your own adjustments. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure um, how well that will work. Um, I mean, you'd have to then convince your local government to use your adjustments, um, which is feasible, but it won't drive any more federal funding to your locality. So, well, here, so let, me, let me add something here which is um, there are some states, for example, that have um, passed legislation within their state that allow special censuses to be done. Illinois is one state. Um, so the Census Bureau, if you, if you, you can pay the Census Bureau to come in um, during the course of the decade between censuses and do a special census to recount. Um, that's a very, that happens a lot actually in some states where special censuses are done and that um, can help, uh, you know, it doesn't help as much in the federal arena, but it certainly helps for state allocations. For example, if you have an uneven count throughout the state, like let's say uh, one city is particularly badly counted or the rural areas are, are badly counted, you can redo it through a special census in the Census Bureau. The other thing that could happen, um, and this has happened in the past, is that um, the Census Bureau itself, if allowed, can go back and do adjustments to the numbers. It, it may not affect apportionment, it may be past the deadline for apportionment, but it certainly could be adjusted for other purposes like the sample frames that are used in the sample household surveys like the ACS. So you have a more accurate sample. Many of the federal statistical agencies use the census as the basis for pulling sample for the sample survey. So it would be very important actually for the Census Bureau to go back and fix that. If once they measure the quality, the quality shows that um, there's really a lot of unevenness and accuracy around the country because if you don't do that, you're building a lot of bias into all the sample frames for the future surveys for the people who got left out of the census. So I think the census bureau actually needs to do that type of adjustment in any case if once the quality is 
is measured, it shows um, this kind of disparate impact of accuracy around the country. And it's possible to go back and actually do a real adjustment of the numbers that might be used for future funding allocation. So there's a lot of options open after the fact that the Census Bureau itself could do, but whether they actually do it or not remains to be seen and it could require Congress telling them to do it. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you to uh, Margo and thank you to Allison. We're being um, nudged a little bit <laughs> and told that um, we have to wrap up. So we're gonna wrap up. I thank the panelists. I um, thank uh, our friends at ICPSR for um, logistically making this all work. Um, and I thank uh, the participants. Um, we've had, uh, I don't know, it went up over 170 at one point when I happened to glance down. So I think that's a pretty good record for our uh, noon time today. Um, and even my friend Bob Ray, who serves on the ICPSR Council with me, uh, and others are sending in nice little thank you notes to us um, as we speak. Uh, someone did ask, uh, I think they weren't on at the very beginning perhaps, whether there will be a recording. Uh, and I think the answer from uh, my colleagues at ICPSR was yes. Uh, there will be a recording and the, the slides will be available uh, right, as soon as possible after the data fair. Um, I know they're <laughs> probably looking forward to um, perhaps taking a, a few hours off this afternoon uh, uh, whenever this all ends. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, we will try to get some answers to the questions we weren't able to address um, and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you all. <laughs>